On today's show, Elon Musk makes many Australians very happy, and I take a look at what car makers have been doing to help in the fight against COVID. G'day, my name's Chris, and I cover everything around renewable technologies like electric vehicles, batteries, solar, wind, and well more. If you're new to the channel, welcome, subscribe. More than 6,000 people have. Thank you so much. I really, really do sincerely mean that. And hey, if you want to support me to the next level, consider joining us over here on Patreon, along with like Ashley Hill, Nigel Farrier, Ray Johnson, and we'll test in the gong, where those guys, as well as others, also get access to like early access content, polls, news, information more that you just don't get here. So if you've been well, and I hope you have been well, I trust this episode will be interesting for you. And well, let's get straight to the news. And that is that the first Tesla Powerwall 2 has been installed in Hunter Region, New South Wales, under the Empowering Homes program. This program announced like by the New South Wales government recently, will see more than 300,000 battery storage systems installed on an interest-free loan scheme. The 12 month pilot offers interest free loans of up to like $14,000 for a solar battery system, $9,000 for the addition of a battery to an existing solar system, or as long as the homeowner's uh, income is like less than $180,000 per year. Yeah, to forget the orbit, I just spoke out a term. Anyhow, the program isn't brand specific, meaning that homeowners can actually choose th through the improved installer, a system like from Tesla, Enphase, SunGrow, Sonnen, Scenic, and what more. Compared to like the Victorian cap of like $4,800, this is actually very generous and that something people should be looking into. For us, our Powerwall was saving about $100 per month or $1,200 per year. The repay for our system is going to be about, well, maybe eight years or so, but that's based upon today's prices. I look forward to the day that when it's paid for itself, that we'll continue to enjoy the free power that we kind of already get right now, but it's paying itself off. You get the idea. If you want more information about this, please look below where you'll find links and timestamps to all of today's stories. And speaking of timestamps, you may notice a few weeks ago, I found a little awesome feature on YouTube that does this little funky thing on the bottom here. Yeah, so it means you can jump to whatever story you might be interested into really, really fast. <laughs> You're welcome. Let's take a quick look at what car makers have been doing to help during these challenging times. Nissan has started making protective gowns for UK's NHS workers. A team of staff volunteers at the plant took just eight days to design and build a process on site to manufacture the plastic aprons. Initial capacity is like at 18,000 units per week, but the team has plans to increase this to over 70,000 within weeks. Hyundai donated $4 million to like 22 hospitals throughout the US to support the COVID-19 drive-through testing centers where people in need of a COVID test could drive up and get tested using the RT-PCR tests that were actually developed in South Korea. Hyundai's racing partner, Brian Herder Autosport, is assembling 3,000 face shields per week and they've been delivered to the Indiana National Guard for the first responders. In America, Hyundai is offering 50% discount on scheduled maintenance servicing for healthcare workers when they service their car. Ford committed to producing 50,000 ventilators at their Michigan component plant, and well, production started last Monday, April 20, and they will cap out a planned 30,000 units per month once lines are up to speed. Both Hyundai and Ford said that they will make up to six months of payments for new owners who lose their jobs due to COVID-19 or maybe have purchased recently and had their car leased and they'll give them a bit of relief in that space as well. Seat manufactured more than 600 ventilators and thousands of surgical masks for local healthcare authorities during their production shutdown. Tesla donated medical supplies and more than a thousand ventilators and is working on their own ventilator, which who knows, maybe one day will actually be a brand of Tesla, hmm, maybe? Now, I've tried looking into, but haven't been able to establish that it seems that most, but almost all car makers are actually extending their car warranty programs anywhere from like three to six months, depending on the manufacturer. If your car is nearing the end of its warranty and you need something fixed, but maybe you're too afraid to go out and get it done, or maybe the business is even closed temporarily, my suggestion, give your dealership a call. There should be a helpline and see what's covered. And finally, just slightly off topic, Kia has released a series of videos about how to look after your car during these difficult times. And one of them is like, 
how to care for the battery and maybe if your car isn't going out anywhere near as much where they suggest you at least have the car on for about 20 minutes and do that at least once every fortnight. Okay, it's mail time. And well, from last week's poll, I asked about what you would rather see, what hours per kilometer, kilowatt hours per um, 100 kilometers or the other method. What is it? Um, you know, miles per gallon sort of system. I do not get that. Anyhow, more than two thirds of you prefer watt hours per kilometer and one third supported the kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Now this comes off the back um, of a story that I saw by Robert Lewin from the Fully Charged Show and his long-term review of his Kona EV, where I think quite rightly, and it's a little bit of bias here, you can tell, can't you? That we already measure cars in kilowatt hours and so maybe we should also be doing the same in terms of efficiency and range that way. Okay, so some of your comments were along the lines of these. Watt hours per kilometer. That's the worldwide standard, so get used to it everyone. There's nothing worse than multiple standards being continually used. I grew up with miles per gallon, then switched to liters per 100 kilometers. Now, miles per gallon means almost nothing to me. If you start using watt hours per kilometer, it won't be long till everything else is irrelevant. Nothing annoys me more with ICE vehicles than old farts, mostly, insist on using kilometers per liter. Get with the program, people. Okay, yes, if you keep with something long enough, it becomes a norm, but does that actually make it right? I mean, look to America. That's only one of three countries in the world that has stuck with imperial, imperial measurement system, where without a calculator, you can't convert like inches to feet to miles. <laughs> no, no. So. Don't get me started on like how they manage the, the fluids and ounces. Oh gosh, all right, no, no, we're not doing that. Then there were comments like this by Neil. I prefer kilometers per kilowatt hour. My 40 kilowatt hour leaf, I simply multiply kilometers by my kilowatt hour rating of the battery to roughly estimate the range of the car in a measured estimate of the total range of the car. It's easy and understandable for me to do in this my humble opinion. And oh my gosh, my brain kind of hurts just even thinking about that. I actually have like an online calculator, like an Excel thingy that I actually use when I'm doing car reviews so I can understand uh, what the actual range would be. And yeah, that's the formula I use. But that said, that just seems incredibly hard and something that most people want me to get their heads around quite easily. So whilst the status quo, like watt hours per kilometer, and I should just build a bridge and simply move a decimal point one spot to the right to arrive at like kilowatts per 100 kilometers. <laughs> See how easy that is my American friends, hey? Anyway, I think that the best comment in this is this one. Reg8530KG says, aren't cars in Australia measured in liters per 100 kilometers at the moment? Wouldn't it be smart just to change that to kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers? That way, it'll be easier for people to understand the price benefits of electricity costs versus petrol or gas. Yes, yes, and yes. This is exactly what my point is, and maybe Robert Lewens for that matter. Use something that we already know and well can understand. Almost the world over, and I'm not sure by the way, and correct me if I'm wrong, put it down below, that people pay for the power at home in kilowatts and the amount of energy they use in kilowatt hours. So if I say to someone on the street, this electric car uses 10 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. Again, hear the same term that all the car makers use in Australia. They can quickly do the math and understand that if the electric, their electricity price at home was say, I don't know, uh, 20 cents per kilowatt hour and they just heard this car uses 10 kilowatts. So they're gonna basically do 10 times 20. Oh, that's gonna be $2 per 100 kilometers. They will quickly understand that even in these times of extremely cheap petrol, like 90 cents per liter, it's probably even gonna go lower. Yikes. They go, hmm, okay. So 20 cents per kilowatt versus 90 cents per liter. That's kind of like four times cheaper. You get that? That, that to me is gonna be the game changer. 
several weeks ago, I brought you the story around uh, air pollution and the mortality rate of COVID-19. And we've well, now found some uh, Australian satellite pictures that I'd like to bring to you. Conversation.com. They found satellite pictures showing nitrogen dioxide levels over a period of time from mid-March 2020 to April 2020. And P.S. Why nitrogen dioxide? because like, it's an important indicator of air pollution as it contributes to the formation of photochemical smog, which can have a significant impact on human health. So the result? Well, it might surprise you that whilst parts of Queensland and New South Wales have seen improvements by 30%, Perth remains unchanged. And in well, Newcastle, Melbourne and Perth, they, they got worse by about 20 to 40%. Why? I don't know why. Given that our roads are like way quieter than normal, Theconversation.com suggested that maybe coal plants, because people are at home now and using more energy, and that back burning or maybe smoke from the bushfires might be to blame. But those last two seem like a bit of a stretch to me. So, what do you think? Are you surprised like me? Put your comments down below. Next up, let's get into some bites. More and more car makers have or are planning on getting back into making cars once again. In particular, VW's uh, Zawaku's German plant, I think that's pronounced it, uh, will be back to making what is planned 300 vehicles per 300,000 vehicles per year, and it's going to be gradually restart, restarting the line of the ID3 at first reduced capacity and slower cycle times. Tesla Gigafactory in Nevada is also opening or well, reopening slightly from May 4th. Seat will restart limited production Monday the 27th of April at the Martorell, Barcelona and component plants, allowing the observance of, of like health and safety measures. And perhaps controversially, they'll be going to test all employees for COVID-19 upon re return to work. Now, why do I say controversial? Well, firstly, current tests take two to three days before the result is actually known. Okay, so if, for instance, you test me, I go home, I go to the supermarket, I go out for a few walks, I come back to work three days later after being cleared. But what about during those three days? What if I was exposed to the virus? You can quickly understand the issue, right? So this is why it's important that in these times more than ever, if you feel slightly unwell, please do stay home. This simple thing will save lives. Tesla has pushed out a software update that increases model S and X Raven models so that they can now go from zero to 60 miles per hour in just 2.3 and what 2.6 seconds respectively. Using the car's air suspension to push, some, push the nose of the car down into what Tesla calls the cheetah stance, it promises not only better performance, but also improved quarter mile times, if that's your thing. Maybe, ooh, I don't know. Top Gear magazine, like, are they still a thing, like magazines? Really, I don't know, tell me below. Anyway, they've awarded Hyundai's Kona Electric Best Small Family Car in the magazine's inaugural Electric Awards. Good on them. Now, in a story which I'd personally like to actually see done as a video, Charlie Turner used the European Rapid Charger Network to supply the Kona Electric with like 316 kilowatt hours of electricity to drive through nine countries, about 1,600 kilometers in under 24 hours. Yeah. Well, 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 well. Mercedes-Benz is canceling its hydrogen cell fuel research production. <laughs> Talk about timing, right? Just last week, I spoke about how hydrogen fuel and well, how it isn't something we'll see in cars. Yeah, well, due to reasons up here. So go check it out if you want to see a bit more about that one. So why are they withdrawing from the market around the hydrogen fuel cell things? Well, it turns out that after more than 30 years of research, getting one of these little suckers into a car is well, about twice as expensive. Yeah, so just stick with battery electric. Mmm. Queensland researchers have developed a method of capturing and storing energy at three times the rate of standard lithium ion batteries powered by diamonds. Now, whilst I don't understand how these diamond batteries work and how they could apply to say like EVs, researchers have found a way to twist bundles of like diamond filaments into mechanically store energy. How much energy? Well, at a rate of like 1.6 megajoules per kilogram. That's five orders higher than a conventional steel spring and up to three times higher than existing lithium ion batteries. Practical applications are at least three years away 
But this tech could have been well seen, not only in EVs, but it can also supposed to be used in aerospace and other industries. So watch this space. And lastly, following up on last week's story about connectivity packages for Australian uh, Tesla owners, well, guess what? It bloody well occurred. Yeah, I, I, I need to eat my own words because now, it's at Australian $9.99 per month. And that works out to be like $6.38 American per month. That's more than $3 cheaper. Good on you, Elon. Okay, one final story, and this one will lead to this week's poll. So hang around just for a few minutes more, so that because I'd like to know your thoughts. Imagine this. You're considering your next car purchase. There are things to consider. Budget, features, brand, resale value, you name it. But do you consider emissions and, well, fuel efficiency? This is something which UK non-profit Air Alliance wants to make clearer and, well, more objective. Providing a sticker on the car as well as free access on the web, their system shows how your next car compared to its, well, claimed outputs with both real-world nitrogen oxide and carbon dioxide emissions, as well, these are also important pollutants that are measured to assess air quality and climate change. And well, hold on Chris, there's nothing new here. Car dealers in Australia show not only fuel efficiency, but some might also show grams of CO2 per kilometre. And hey, 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 what, a, what about these guys? Yeah, you remember what they did? Mm, mm, I know, it's terrible, right? So, what separates Air Alliance from other testing methods, which might involve car makers testing their own cars, and then therefore like cheating on them. They test at least two different cars or vans of each model sold and on the road and sourced independently from the vehicle maker in a scientifically robust program. Yeah, and they actually put them on real road trips, okay? So what that means is that a car maker can't send out a model that has been designed to cheat on emissions tests. And it will, interestingly, some cars in Europe that are classed as Euro 6, that's like been around since 2014, 2015, around then. And um, that's a requirement now to put out a brand new car in Europe. And well, some people think that maybe one of the cleanest cars that you can buy, which isn't, by the way, which isn't, might actually be quite dirty. For example, the Kia Sportage 1.6 litre variant scored like an A for NOx levels, but D for CO2 levels. Yeah. So here's my poll question for this week. If the airline sticker system was introduced in your country, where would you put it in terms of importance? If emissions are the most important thing, then you put it at number one, okay? If maybe price was at the top of your priority list, that would also be another one. I'll try and make it clear as I can up here, but YouTube limits my character count, so yeah. Um, I'm not very sure how it looks right now, but by the time I've edited this, hopefully it will make some sense, okay? All right, with that said, I really do hope you've enjoyed this show. Again, thanks to my awesome patrons for supporting me and um, for you guys for tuning in every week and so forth. Um, this next week's gonna be rather interesting. Um, I myself are getting back to a little bit of part-time work, just a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's, um, things are changing in the world, hopefully for the better. So I do hope that you and your family and friends are all well and safe. And uh, yeah, subscribe to the channel, put a comment down below, share this video on your socials, and if you do nothing, you'll be good and you'll be great. Do you want